poet scholar Octavio Paz wrote, For the chronicler of an era, knowing how to listen is even more important than knowing how to write. Or better, the art of writing implies previous mastery of the art of listening. A subtle and difficult art, for it requires not only sharp ears, but also great moral sensitivity, recognizing, accepting the existence of other. There are two breeds of writers, the poet who hearkens to an inner voice, his own, and the novelist, the journalist, and the historian who hearken to many voices in the world round about them, the voices of others. For my Mellon Public Scholar Project, I worked with CAP Radio and Local Voices Network to facilitate a series of virtual community conversations centered on Stockton's Latinx community and the impact of COVID-19. Since mid-March, we have all been grappling with the pandemic's impact on our families, schools, work, and communities. For black and brown communities, this impact has been devastating. The latest CDC data shows that Latinx and black Americans are dying at rates 3.2 times higher than white Americans. In Stockton, where the majority of residents are Latinx, this impact is being felt everywhere. Essential workers to farm workers, multi-generational households to undocumented families. Some of the issues that came up again and again in our community conversations were around livelihood, food insecurity, childcare, healthcare access, and mutual aid resources. I'd like to share with you some of their voices and stories that I got the chance to bear witness to over the summer. Leo, 33, was born in Mexico He's a proud immigrant, lives in Eight Mile, works as a musician, and works at Fathers and Families in San Joaquin. He shares how his organization is helping the most vulnerable in the Latinx community. By that, I mean, like, since the pandemic started, I feel like the organization that I work for has pretty much gone down the list of who needs to be supported. And by that, I mean, like, the undocumented who didn't qualify for the federal, you know, checks, those who are experiencing domestic violence at home during COVID who have to be at home. Youth can't come out of the house, but want to and don't have and feel unsupported, right? The elders who need food, who need medication, who need care, who can't come out of their homes. You know, it's like, and then the formerly incarcerated as well, who have been let out early on because of COVID and not have any resources and any support. And they come into a world where they don't know what the hell is going on. I feel like we've gone down above and beyond to make sure that a lot of those populations are covered to a certain degree. Right. So I would say that the stories that, the, that I have are those when we see the success and, and those people's, you know, smiles or, and, and, and seeing them sort of be alleviated for that temporary amount of time. Even if it means like, you know, we're going to give you five hundred dollars as a as a as an undocu fund, to know that that is going to help you pay for your month's rent or or your utilities, that's a story for me to say. I'm glad that we were able to help your strength by supplementing our strength with yours, right? Nancy, an instructor at Sac State and co-director of Nopal, working with Latinx youth in Stockton, shares her concerns about family members who are essential workers and vulnerable to COVID-19. One of the things that uh, I'm concerned about is I'm a daughter of a waiter that, um, you know, my father's 85 years old, but worked until he was 80, um, serving people serving people their food. And when this pandemic happened, the first thing I thought to myself is all the wait stuff. They're now out of work. The first thing these businesses, and this is us, we're the ones are constantly serving and we're dependent on the tips and we're dependent on to make a little extra money. And now 
where do I go? I'm, this is, this is my life. I mean, this is for my family. Our life is restaurants, right? Serving people. And my mom is in, um, uh, retired from housekeeping, from cleaning hospital rooms. She would be a vulnerable person there trying to take care, you know, cleaning rooms and hospitals and patients. But I, that he, my father is the main, uh, earner for my family. So um, Dr. Gracie Madrid, we were in this call with the community. And the first thing that came to my mind, we we're like, well, how are we going to help? I was like, we're going to help the farm workers. We're going to help those in need that aren't going to be able to collect anything. We're not thinking about our mixed status families. Our mixed status families did not get a stimulus check uh, to take care of their families to make rent. So how am I going to make rent? Because we're mixed, because I, I'm married to somebody that doesn't have uh, documentation of it is, and now you're taking away my tax money that I may be eligible for because of who I'm married with or where my children were born or where my parents were born. So I immediately go into um, a, a, a anxiety level for the families of where do I go now? Where do I get my money? Where can I get money? What can I do now? Uh, and then for those of us that are working for, for some of us, where do I leave my children with? Who do I leave my children with? And I don't have enough funding to be able to pay somebody $120 a day so I can go to work to take care of my children. Um, so, so I get, because I don't have the funding, I can't make that happen. So. Martin, an entrepreneur and owner of More Kombucha, asks what happens to essential workers who have to quarantine and still pay their bills. But I think something that's not talked about either, right? Say once they do go get testing, um, say if they test positive, right? Like kind of like a lot of, we know, I'm, I'm speaking from a point of being privileged, right? I have a job, I have a business, I, you know, I, I do I do acknowledge that I'm privileged more than others. And I that's why I try to give back as much as I can just because it's needed, right? But what are we doing with individuals that, that have to quarantine? These, they're not going to listen. They they're gonna worry about paying the day they go out there work in the fields or whatever that work may look like. This would be a street vendor selling fruit. Um, they could do it could be so many different jobs that they're doing out here on the front lines every day. That that literally the money they make that day is what they're eating with that same same evening, right? That's their dinner. That's their that's their bill. That's their whatever you want to call it. That's their basic needs. There's nothing being done like. Other communities are doing it, so I know it's, it could be possible, but I, I just think we need to focus on how do we make them stay home and be safe. Um, and also that to not be stressed on what are they going to eat that day? Because quarantining is one thing, but also like what are you eating and what are you ingesting? What are you, how are you paying your bills, right? Because a lot of this. Sammy, founding executive director of Fathers and Families of San Joaquin, Shares how difficult life is for farm workers, campesinos. And we, uh, and I've seen, and I, and I can bear witness to the fact that we have fed the world in this community and yet have some of the cruelest food insecurity in the world. So many have benefited from the labor of our campesinos, yet they're denied the dignity and the respect that they deserve. They're the lowliest. Some might say, well, you know, that's, uh, you know, that's, it, it, there's, uh, there's, uh, they should be thankful that they have an opportunity. Uh, I would say that's just a ridiculous notion because I think, again, that uh, most folks, and obviously, uh, if they were really honest about it, uh, or rigorously honest, uh, their relatives, their ancestors have migrated for the same reasons. It's a freedom story. I'd say that, you know, in terms of uh, what I feel uh, it's important to recognize, too, is that uh, that even despite, um, you know, uh, the, the um, despite that, I guess the misinformation, our field workers also actually have one of the most dangerous jobs uh, in the world. Uh, when you look at the most dangerous jobs to have, it falls in more or less around 13th most dangerous job to have in America, to be a campesino, to be a field worker, to pick the fruits and vegetables and feed the world. By comparison, police officers fall around 16th. And the actual disparity 
the occupational hazards are more concentrated, yet the economics behind it are really stark. Next, we're going to hear from Condelaria, a trustee for Stockton Unified School District, who works at Daily Cause and is a mother of two. She discusses the challenges of distance learning and lack of childcare. But, but childcare has been really challenging and, um, and not everyone can work from home. And I think that has already been clear with the conversations we've heard. Not everyone has a home. Uh, and, and our, it's, I, I just, we're all in a really difficult situation where what do we do when, like Lopita was saying, our students, like even our, our schools are providing meals, even though we're not having in in class, uh, students in class. But what about transportation? Like our buses are not, our, like our public school buses to transport our kids are not ready right now. Like they can't, it's difficult for parents who have to get up before the sun even rises. So the, the schools are not going to be open anyway to, you know, give out breakfast and lunch at that time. It's just a really challenging situation. As hard as we're all working to make it more accessible, they're, the needs of our community are very challenging. They're very great. Um, but and finally, we're going to hear from Leo, who you heard earlier posing some tough questions about the disparities impacting Latinx communities. Absolutely. This, my question is like, like how many deaths, how many, how many deportations, how many injustices is it going to take for America to come to terms with its inhumanity and start seeing these folks as human beings? Like how much data and information is the United States going to need of Latinx deaths and Latinx injustices for them to actually come to terms with that? How much is it enough, right, for them to acknowledge humanity? Is it going to take a whole... Is it going to take thousands of deportations? Is it going to take thousands of Latino deaths for, for the United States to finally acknowledge the humanity and the injustices that it's done towards our people? I mean, how much is it going to take? How many stories are we going to have to tell until them or anybody comes to terms with how inhumane it's been since the, the pandemic? Until when do we get to be seen as humans? 